But either way, we're going to do this memory verse so that you can uh, get it in your system and then I'll read verses 4 through 8. So let's read Romans 12, 1 through 3. I'm in the English Standard Version. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think for himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. All right. Are y'all ready? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone that is among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but think with sober judgment, as God has dealt to every man in measure of faith, or according as God has dealt to every man in measure of faith. All right. We kind of stumbled and mumbled and jumbled through that, but here we go. Romans 12, 4 through 8. All right, we're going to read this. We'll do the memory work on this later. Romans 12, 4 through 8. Don't give up on the memory work. I know some people are like, I was doing so good, and now it's getting harder. You can do it. You can. All right, so don't give up. Just keep learning. And um, if you memorize 15 verses of Romans 12 instead of 21, you'll still be better off, right? All right, let's do 4 through 8. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. <clears throat> Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So, so far in Romans 12, Paul has talked about how to be a living sacrifice. Verse 1, he says, present your body. You've got to give God your body. Present your body as a living sacrifice to God, which is really acceptable service. And then in verse 2, he says, this happens when your mind gets changed. By the renewing of your mind, you're able to figure out what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he says you've got to have your mind renewed. And then in verse 3, he talks about seeing ourselves as we truly are. And when we met two weeks ago, we talked about that. He says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think with sober and clear judgment. See yourself as you really are, according as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. But now tonight, Paul gets practical. Paul gets down to where we live in verses 4 through 8. And he thinks about, or he helps us to answer some of the questions that we might have like this. What is it that I can do for God? What does God want me to do? Or what is it that God has equipped me to do? And so you think about being a living sacrifice and living your life on the altar for God. And what we're going to talk about tonight is finding our function in the body of Christ. This matters because if we don't do what we should, we won't just disappoint God, but we'll offend him. Because Paul is saying, hey, get on the altar, be a living sacrifice for God. But now verses 4 through 8, he's going to say, here are the specific ways that you do that. To fail to be of service to God as we should, not only disappoints him and offends him because, and Paul's going to unpack this for us, he's the one that gave us the gifts in the first place. So to sit on the sideline of Christianity and say, well, I just couldn't possibly be involved. There's nothing I can do, or I don't have any gifts to offer to God. Our stagnation in service is not just... Well, God doesn't like that. He's disappointed. He wants you out there. But it also is to say, hey, didn't I give you everything you need? James 1, 17, every good and every perfect gift comes from where? Comes from above, from the Father of lights. No variation or shadow of turning with him. And so God's given us what we need, and he wants us to go out and to do something with it. And so in Romans 12, 4 through 8, Paul speaks of gifts given to the church and how those gifts are to be used. I'll let you decide, and we'll do this together when we get through 5 through 7, which of these are miraculous, which of them are continuous today. Because some of the gifts that Paul mentions in that section are miraculous, and some do continue on today. But the point is, there's still a gift that we have. And we'll get practical about how we can develop our own and some things we should not do that might hinder us from doing that. And so let's start tonight with verses 4 and 5. Paul starts out in this section by saying, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, 
and we're individually members one of another. So Paul uses one of his favorite metaphors for the church, really for the Christian life. He says we're the what of Christ, or we being many are one what? Uh, we're one body. Paul loves to do this. Paul's saying, hey, there's one family of God. You remember Jesus prayed in John 17 that we might all be one, that there be no division among us. We, he wants us in the same family. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says, for by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. And so this idea of the one body is something that Paul typically refers back to. He normally has one of two ideas in mind or a combination. Sometimes in the New Testament, Paul says, look, guys, you're one body. And what he wants to do is draw this idea. Hey, focus on your relationship to Jesus. And so he'll say you're one body. And then he'll talk about the head, which is Jesus Christ. He does that in Colossians 1.18 and Colossians 1.24. But other times, Paul says, hey, you're one body in Christ. And the focus isn't so much on Jesus, though he's not out of view. He talks about our relationship to each other. So either way, Paul could be talking about our relationship to each other or our relationship to Christ. But he uses this idea of the body. It's probably his favorite way to refer to the church. And so here's the question. What is the purpose of Paul describing the church as a body? What is he trying to communicate with that analogy? What do you think Paul's trying to say? In either case, if Paul's talking about our relationship to Jesus or our relationship to each other, when Paul talks about the church, sometimes, you know, Paul doesn't say body. He says, hey, you're the temple of God, Ephesians 2. Sometimes he talks about family, 1 Timothy 3.15. You're the church of the living God, the household of faith. But when Paul says you're the body of Christ, why that? What is that supposed to suggest to us? Why say the body? Whenever he brings up the concept of um, churches uh, as body, with the focus being on the uh, uh, individual members of the church itself instead of uh, you know, the head being Christ, he, he's usually emphasizing that there is uni uh, unity even though there's variety, just like the body, a variety of parts of the body, but the body is unified. Okay, so there's this unity. What else? What else do you think, Paul? And I think that's right, Andy, by the way. Uh, Derek? I think it's also illustrating that we are, we are the mechanism, but we're working only through his authority. Yeah. Because he's the head. And uh, us being the body, we're doing his work, but it's <coughs> according to his plan. Yeah, so this idea of the body may stretch to show our dependency, right? We can't do anything without Jesus. And so in the end, we do have a role, but our role is in a minimal sense in comparison with, to Jesus, who is the head. So Paul uses the metaphor of the body to sometimes talk about the idea of, hey, we need to appreciate the fact that we can't do it without Jesus. And Andy mentioned some things as well about our role in being servants together. What else? What do you think about? Why does Paul choose body? Because it's going to matter here in this section on gifts and abilities and our contributions to the work. So why say, hey, you're a body. You're, you're the one body of Christ. Chelsea. Well, he's showing that we all have function, like individual jobs. Mm -hmm. Like how your arm would be important just as your leg would be important. They have two different um, abilities, which I would think... That's why he brings out gifts. If you do this, you have this, do this. Yeah, that's going to come up again. So that's that's right. Especially in 1 Corinthians 12, he does the same thing, right? And so he says, hey, you've got this part of the body, the physical. Whenever Paul mentions the body of Christ, whether he's emphasizing our relationship to Jesus, whether he's emphasizing our relationship to one another, or a combination of both, he really is doing it for many of the reasons suggested, but he has one main focus. He's shown our connection or our link to one another and or to God. And so he's saying, hey, you don't stand alone. Think about how impactful that is. He's about to talk about gifts, your talents, what you can do and what you can do. But he says, hey, I don't want you to start thinking about it that way. I already told you in verse 3, think soberly. But remember, you're a body. Paul doesn't say, hey, do the work of the Lord. You're a finger. He don't want you to think that way. You might think, hey, I'm special. Paul's saying, remember this idea of a body. Why does it matter? Because if a body, you think about the role of Jesus, right? If a body has two heads, it's a monster, right? If a body has no head, it's dead. So you've got to have a body with a head. Jesus is in charge. If a body has a great head, but it has other things that are wrong with it, it may be able to survive for a while. But over time, that body, at least in the local sense, you think about local congregations and you think about your own physical body, you can do without one arm, you can do without one foot, and you can do, but if so much of the body eventually breaks down, eventually be no good at all. And so Paul is often using this metaphor of the body to show that our bodies and our lives 
are linked to Jesus, and it's to that degree that we can be successful. And so he's saying, hey, before you think about your own individual gifts, I want you to think about what you all are together. All right? And so 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, if one of the members suffers, all of the members suffers with it. And if one of the members rejoices, we all rejoice with it. That's a command in Romans 12. He'll talk about that. But in 1 Corinthians 12, it's just a stated fact because we're so linked together. Our lives are so intertwined that if one member of the church is succeeding in spiritual things, there's a sense in which we all are. And if one member is suffering, then we all are. All right, so the body of the idea of the body says several things. It says Jesus built one church. You've got one body. You're one person. That's all you can be, right? The body says that the church isn't a denomination broken off into various groups and into various parts. But it also says what concerning our gifts? What else does this say? Chelsea was leaning into some of this when she was mentioning the idea of the different functions. What else does a body say about gifts? So Paul's about to start saying some things about if you can do this, you should do it. What what would an idea of the body say to us about gifts? One is not more important or fantastic than another. <clears throat> That's exactly right. This is a team sport. Christianity is what we do together. And so we shouldn't view our gifts as badges of righteousness above others. If we compare ourselves by ourselves or judge ourselves among ourselves, we're not wise, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. But we also shouldn't become jealous of each other and say, well, he can do that and I can't because we're a body. We work together, right? A sound heart is the life of the flesh. Envy is the rottenness of the bones, Proverbs 14, 30. And so in the body of Christ, we don't look across the spiritual fence and say, well, why can he sing so good and I can't? And why can she do this? No. Paul says, remember, before he ever mentions the gift, you guys are a unit. You guys work together. You are individuals, but you do work together. All right, and so then look at the next part of verse 4. So he says you're one body, and then he says, Romans 12, 4, but we have many members. Why say there are many members? So we got the body part. We're a team. We're a unit. We're united to Jesus. Why does Paul tell us we have many members? In connection with this idea tonight, I want you to just keep this main theme in mind, fulfilling your role in the body of Christ. Paul says you're one body. Then he says, he starts with one, then he, he sort of moves out in scope, and he says, hey, we have many members. Why would he say that to people that he wanted to encourage to get involved? If you were trying to get church members involved and you started out, hey, we've got one body. People can get with that. Hey, we're a team. But we've got many members. Why would you say that? What does that mean? You have to do your part. Yes, you have to do your part. That's important. We've got many members. You've got to do your part. So they're great. We've got this great idea of the unity of the body, but then you've got to do your part. What else? There are others to support you. There are others to support you. No one person needs to do it all. I think he's going to make even a stronger point than that in a minute, Chrissy. No one person can. Do you ever feel like it's all you? You're doing everything? You're the only one working? You feel like, man, I wish more people cared about Jesus as much as I did? Or you ever feel like um, at least if you're not the only one, you're one of the main people on the altar? Paul says, avoid the Elijah complex. There are many members. Somebody says, but I'm a, con I'm a member of a congregation of 20 people. You think too small. Paul's saying the whole body of Christ, you're not the only one working for Jesus. So Jesus wants your gift, but there are many members. There are a lot of people. So when you get your gift and your ability and you can do what you're doing, remember there are other people doing things too. So don't feel like it's all on you, that you have to do everything. This is a relieving idea that Paul is saying, hey, there are many members. If you just get involved, don't feel like some people... Well, Greg's going to say amen to this. But anyway, I've been a part of this before. Hey, we need to get Bible class teachers. And somebody says, you know what? I would teach, but if I teach, I'm just afraid I'm going to get roped in. And I'll never be able to get out of this class. Once I start teaching, they're going to have to. Many... Imagine if you went to somebody and you said, hey, we need you to do this. But we've got many members. There are a lot of people that could help with this. It wouldn't fall just on you. That's what Jesus is saying. Like Eli mentioned tonight, God wants us to be on this team and to work. But God is also saying, hey, there are many people. It won't just be you. There will be other people that will be involved. And um, look at verse 4, the end. And we don't all have the same function. All right? So this word translated as function, it means activity, function, or way of acting. That's what it means. Praxis. It means we all don't act the same way. We don't all function the same way. Paul is saying we're all on the same team. There are many of us doing this work. We'll get concrete in a minute. Trust me. We're going to walk through what these gifts are, what we can do, and even practically what we can do today. But we've got to set the table. We're a body. There are many members, and we don't all have the same function. 
All right, this is huge. This idea that we don't have the same function. It destroys several false ideas in Christianity. Here they are. Somebody says, he's not doing anything because he's not doing what I'm doing. We don't all have the same function, do we? What about this one? I don't contribute anything. Look at what they can do. They're a lot more active than me. But we don't all have the same function. You wouldn't assume that they could do the same thing you should do or that you'd be doing because we don't all have the same function. Or everybody in the church needs to do X or they don't really love the Lord. Right? We don't all have the same function. Now listen, I'll give you one example. Everybody in the church needs to be involved, involved in evangelism. But according to this passage, not everybody in the church is going to sit down and have a Bible study. Everybody's effort and soul winning won't be the same. Some people will bring, some people will study, some people will encourage. Some people, Epaphras, Colossians 4, verse 12, will agonize in prayer over those that can go out and do the work. I'm telling you, Paul says everybody does not have the same function. And we discourage people and misinform them when we suggest that they should. I want everybody to do as much as they can for the Lord, and we all should, but everybody can't do the same things. And if we put up a list of, hey, here are five works in the church. These are very important. These are, in fact, the most important. If you don't do these, you're not active. There'll be some people that won't do those. They're not wired to do those. And then they'll translate that into, I can't do anything. When Paul is telling us, everybody shouldn't be doing the same thing. Don't get caught. Don't get stuck in this one avenue of work because all church members don't do the same work. That's the way God designed the body. And so we shouldn't try to design it uh, any other way. Paul is saying, don't expect everyone to do the same thing. Listen, you don't need 12 point guards on a basketball team. You don't, right? You don't need 10 quarterbacks on a football team. You don't need 35 math professors at a university. It just wouldn't make sense. You'd be overloaded. You'd be top heavy in one area. But what about all these other areas that you're going to need servants and helpers in? And that's how we've got to do the church. We should be thinking about what are the areas that aren't tapped into? How does knowledge of the fact that we don't all have the same function help us to live as living sacrifices for Jesus? How does this help us to live for him when we realize we don't all have the same function? We can still contribute. We can still contribute? Yeah, we can. No matter what we can offer, we can contribute and we can know it's making a difference. Okay, what else? How does knowledge of this idea that we don't all have the same function help us? To live as living sacrifices. It keeps us from being envious and jealous of others. Yeah, okay. Also Keep. keeps us from being haughty and prideful spirit. Yeah, yeah. Why would we get a prideful spirit in our service? How could that happen? Well, you read the comment while ago, the quote, if everybody could do as much as I'm doing, or, you know, eventually you're acting out of proportion with your faith, I think it says in verse 6. Mm -hmm. Once you start acting out of proportion with your faith, it becomes faith in yourself instead of faith in Christ. Okay. What else? All members don't have the same function. It helps you focus on figuring out what your function will be. That's where we need to put the effort, right? We can spend so much time talking about all the things we can't do, all the things we're no good at, all the things we can never do. But what if we realize, hey, here are the things that I can do. Now, you don't get off the hook with that. You must do those things. You've got to actively be involved. Jerry, you had something? Um, I was just thinking about 1 Corinthians 12, kind of earlier on in the chapter, when he talks about, you know, the whole body was an eye, I think, or mm -hmm. the sense of smell be, or whatever. If we think about using his illustration as, as being part of the body, if we think about each individual member as a unique function, which I think is ex expands on maybe a little bit more in Ephesians 4, then what he was saying, uh, actually almost worth the word that I have in my head, was we can identify our function and then realistically attain that uh, and most effectively work. Because if we try to, if we have this mentality that we all need to be super effervescent, evangelistic, you know, expert theologians, like you said, not everyone's part that way, but if we can identify our own function and, you know, kind of have a realistic expectation of our abilities, then we can actually serve the body healthily. Yeah, I would imagine. I, I wonder how much we may have robbed ourselves of throughout the years by not tapping into everybody's talent. The work of the church is the same, to edify, to evangelize, and to do. Those things haven't changed. But I don't think we've exhausted all the ways those things can be done and the people in our pews that can get out and do those things. And so what we need to do is to try to say to people, when your desire to serve 
collides with an opportunity to do so and your abilities, that's when you're really going to be effective in service for Jesus Christ. When your desire to serve, along with your abilities, collides with a biblical opportunity to serve, that's when you're going to be at your best bet. Not being, through being guilted into it, through somebody saying, hey, you need to do this one work here. But when you say, you know what, I'm wired to do this, I really would like to do this, and there's a biblical avenue for doing this, then when those two things collide, then you really are going to, we're going to be the people that God wants us to be. And so we've got to think through that and remember what Paul is getting at. He's going to talk about the gifts that we have, but everybody doesn't do the same thing. And so our preaching and teaching needs to reflect this. The opportunities for serving in the local congregation needs to reflect. This is a challenge because we're tip, we typically think like we think. We want other people to do it the way that we would do it. But we need to be tapping into other individuals in the body and saying, hey, maybe A is not involved, not because he's lazy, not because he doesn't care, but maybe we haven't tapped into what he could possibly offer. Maybe nobody ever asked him, hey, what can you do? What do you like to do? What are your gifts and your abilities? And then we might find out he is lazy, right? We might find that out, <laughs> but you didn't know that before. And our, 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 our works in the church, our opportunities for service, should reflect what Paul said in Romans 12 and verse 4. If everything in the church looks the same, if all of the works say, hey, here's the profile we're looking for, then that, that's not what Paul taught. That's not what Jesus selected in the apostles. You think about a tax collector, you think about fishermen, you think about a scribal guy like Paul, you just think about the kinds of people that Jesus recruited. It reflects this very idea, because guess what? Everybody doesn't preach on Pentecost. Peter, we got you for that. You're the outspoken person. Everybody's not going to travel to the Roman Empire. But Paul, you've got Roman citizenship. And Silas, you have it too. And you'll be able to weave in and out of circumstances that might have tripped up a Peter or a John. They don't have that. Everybody doesn't function the same way, right? And so once we know that, we can appreciate each other better and we can complement each other a lot better. Because you can do things I can't do. It doesn't matter how much I practice. And it may be the other way around. Up there. You actually said it this time. You got it. Don't you hate me in that? Okay. No. So, and then in verse 5, of course, he ends by saying, keep this in mind, no matter what. We are members of one of another. All right. The New Testament teaches that God gave miraculous gifts to the first century Christians. He did. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 2, excuse me, 1 through 3, talks about him giving those gifts in order to confirm the word. Those, the miraculous gifts, were given by the laying on of the apostles' hands in Acts 8, 17 and 18. Peter and John go down to Samaria. And they lay mirac they hand their hands on those individuals, and the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit is imparted, and they're able to do signs and that sort of thing. Um, Paul mentions seven gifts in verses six through eight, and I've I've listed them here. They're right in the text, so I'm going to rattle these off. There's prophecy, there's service or ministering, um, there's teaching, there's exhortation, or your translation may have encouragement. There is giving and sharing. There is leading or ruling, and then there's showing mercy. And so just think about all of these gifts. The first one, prophecy. How important is prophecy? When Paul compares speaking in tongues to prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14, he said, if you have your pig, always choose prophecy. It's superior to tongues because it edifies the church. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1, 1 Corinthians 14, 39. You think about service. And in service, what do you think about when you see that in verse number Verse number seven, if service and our serving, what is that? What do you think that gift's about? I'll give you a hint, serving, right? That's what it's about. It's the same word in Acts 6 and verse 3, when they select those seven men that kind of, I, I would say they're a precursor to the work of deacons, look out among yourselves seven men full of the Holy Spirit and honest report, and they're able to help other individuals. It's a word that means feet that are swift to service. You might think about a waiter or a waitress. It's at least a part of this word is where we get our word for deacon from. Individuals that just run around, they kick up dirt as they serve. That's the idea. Paul's saying, hey, if that's what you can do in your serving, then serve. He mentions teaching, and this wouldn't be prophecy. Sometimes people have said, well, prophecy is just like preaching and teaching. But this idea of teaching would be somebody who is skilled in communicating the word of God. Paul said Timothy had a gift. And he gave it to him when he laid his hands on him, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6. And I believe that gift is preaching and teaching. Because throughout his writings to Timothy, especially in 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16, he was encouraging him. Preach the word, Timothy. Use the gift. Give attention to read it and to encouragement and to doctrine and the gift of teaching. What about exhortation or encouragement in, in verse number 7 or verse number 8? 
This may deal with preaching and teaching, right? That's a part of preaching to encourage. Paul told Timothy to reprove, rebuke, and exhort, but it wouldn't be just that. Um, I'm preaching on Barnabas on Sunday morning, and one of the things that's said about Barnabas is he was the son of encouragement. It's said before he ever preached the sermon, he sold property and gave it away, and they called him encouraging. Giving or sharing. There's a lady, her name is Faith West. She's gone to her reward now. She was a member of the church where I preached in Florida. And she was a shut in, and she was discouraged about used being able to formally do so many things, be so active, and she said, you know what, now I hire them, all I do is throw money. And one day I got the Bible out, I was at her house, and I showed her Romans 12, I said, um, you don't just throw money, you've been blessed by God to be in a financial position, and now you're able to support work. You're not just, well, now I'm out of the picture, now I'm throwing money. Paul says, your contribution can be, see, we think about a person in the church, he's a Christian, great entrepreneur, that's spiritual. It isn't, well, this is the physical world, here's the spiritual world. According to Paul, if I'm a Christian, everything I have belongs to God, and he may have blessed us in such a way financially so that we can contribute to the work. Paul says the one who gives with generosity. And Faith never seemed to have a problem with her, quote-unquote, throwing money after that. And so she realized that it was actually spiritual work. It was just as spiritual as her knocking doors before and teaching Bible class and being involved in VBS. Paul says if you give, so long as you do it with generosity, it's spiritual work. Leading or ruling. You think about elders and then showing mercy. So out of these seven, help me out. How many of these gifts would you classify as miraculous and no longer in effect today? What would you say out of the seven? Prophecy, serving or ministering, teaching, encouraging, giving and sharing, leading or ruling, and showing mercy. <coughs> so the New Testament says there'd be a time when the miraculous age would cease. How many of these seven would you say, uh, that one's miraculous? How many? Show of hands for one. Show of hands for two. Three. Okay, which one is the miraculous one? Prophecy. Prophecy. Yeah, I would agree with you. What does that say to us then? It wasn't all about the miraculous. Evidently it wasn't. Paul wrote in the age of the miraculous. He mentioned seven gifts. This list isn't exhaustive, obviously, but when Paul talked about things that people could do, Paul talked about things that... You didn't have to have the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit in order to perform. He says, hey, you can encourage. Hey, you can contribute. I know there's people in the first century. In Acts chapter 2, the first thing they're doing is contributing to the local congregation. So much so that they have favor with all the people. Paul says, hey, this isn't a miraculous endeavor. People are often thinking, well, without the miraculous, you're limiting God. But it's the other way around. To assume that God can only work through miraculous means is to limit God, when in fact God does his most extraordinary work through ordinary means every day. And here's an example of it. In Romans 12, Paul says, here are these gifts. Uh, what else do you find interesting about this list? Does anything else stand out to you about this list? It's all others focused. It's others focused, yep. Yeah. How many in this list involve getting up in front of somebody and doing something in a public service? How many of those do you count? We got seven here. How many? Now, some of them may involve that, but I mean, how many of these necessitate that you be where I'm standing or up in front? How many of those? How many do you count? Three. What are your three? I think it's prophecy and uh, teaching and uh, leading. Three out of seven. So the majority of these you could do in what? never be seen. Maybe being done and not being seen, right? And so Paul is saying, hey, look at all of these ways that you could do this. Anything else do you stand out in this list? Depending on the circumstances that could be done by either males or females. Males or females. In fact, Paul's going to make a list four chapters from now, Romans 16, of the people that helped him in his work, and then he signs off on these salutations. The majority of the people that Paul lists in Romans 16, leading off with Phoebe in verse 1, are women who helped Paul. And so it can be done by male or female, right? Again, we can talk about all the things we can't do. In 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15, has something to say to our time and culture about what God wants for leadership in the church. But we do greatly err to spend all of our time on all the things that women can't do or younger people can't do or a person that's not qualified to be an elder instead of look at all the things you can do. It doesn't spend any time at all in an effort to distinguish formal from informal. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that all of these things could be done without standing in front of a crowd of people. 
Yeah, I mean, you could, you could teach in private, couldn't you? Right. Yeah, you could you could prophesy in private or not in a public setting. At least I know there had to be those occasions because Paul talks about women prophesying in 1 Corinthians 11 and in chapter 14, and so that would definitely be the case. The point is, these things could be done. Um, Paul makes mention of these works, and he says you could do these things and you would have the ability to do them. Now, many of these are not public in nature. Very few of them involve any what I would call, quote unquote, natural talent. Many of these things would be developed through habit and practice. And I just want to give us a word of caution because we're going to talk about gifts in a minute in a more specific sense. Beware of refusing to do things in Christianity that don't come naturally. <laughs> Beware of saying, I couldn't do that because it doesn't come natural. While we should work in our areas of strength, we should not assume that we are always able to easily identify those areas without divine aid or through repetition and experience. You and I should not assume, I could never do that. I couldn't leave singing, why? That's just not my natural strength or ability. Who's in the best position to see how good we are at things? God is. And who's to say that we won't become better at doing any number of things through practice, through repetition, or through divine aid and help through his people. Beware of in Christianity saying, I will only do those things. Now, we need to cultivate the areas where we're naturally gifted. And every one of us is naturally gifted in certain areas and with certain things. But beware of limiting yourself in service to the things that you feel come most naturally and easy to you. It's a dangerous thing. We paint ourselves in a corner to say, I'm an introvert. Here's my list. This is what I do. This is what I don't. Again, we don't all have the same function, but beware of limiting your function because there may be more in there than you think. What did John Mark said? Went on a mission trip once, no good at it. There is no gospel of Mark, right? Right? What if, what if Paul was like that? You know, train one guy one time, I'm really not good at training these preachers. There is no First Timothy, there is no Titus. Beware of saying, I will only do those things in Christianity that come to me through ease. Many of the things that we are best at come to us through sweat equity. We've got to learn to do it. Repetition is the father of learning. As we keep doing it, we make it better. Or we may learn, okay, I've tried that. I've done the best that I could. That's really not my area of strength. Here's one more thing. Paul seems to think that everyone has something to contribute. Does everybody in the church have a gift? What do you think? Yes, right? Paul says everybody in the church has something to contribute. Notice how Paul talks about these gifts, though. Look at verse 6. Having gifts according to our ministry, he says, if prophecy, then what? Verse 6. What does he say? If you have prophecy, then what? Prophesy in proportion to your faith. What about service? How does he say you should serve? If service, then what? Serving. What about the one who teaches? And teaching, the one who encourages. Now look at how he ends this. The one who contributes with what? Generosity and the one who leads and the one who does acts of mercy with what? This is what I want you to see. Paul doesn't just say you have gifts and you get to use them. Paul says you and I have gifts and it matters how we use them. What if God was grading you on number one, the gift that you have, are you using it? What if that was one grade? And then there was another grade for the spirit with which you exercise that gift. Would you like your grade? Let me tell you a secret. He is great to us on both of those categories. Not only the gift that we have, Paul didn't just say, hey, if you can give, just go in there and say, all right, I know you need this here. Right? What if somebody came up to you, you were sick, and they knocked on the door? Church people said I should visit. <laughs> they told me to come. Here I am. Right? Paul says when you do it, do it like you want to. Oh, it matters that you use your gift, but it also matters how you use the gift. We don't just get to slop it on God's table and say, all right, God, I guess I'm, they said I've got to do something, so I'm going to show up. What do y'all want me to do? I'm probably not going to be any good at this, but I guess I, Paul says, no. He leads with zeal. You don't beg a man to be an elder. Please, we really need you. We really hope. No, if he doesn't want to do it, he that desires the work, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1. Now, we can encourage him, but we can't force him. He who teaches, there should be a line that says, hey, I really want to do this. We should be, Acts chapter 6, turning people away, saying, hey, look, we're so filled up, we don't have any more room. If you don't want to do the work, you won't really do any good. And so the Bible says there are things we have to do, but then it talks about the spirit in which we have to do those things. Here are a few verses to consider. Please ask these 9 and verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. 
Colossians 3, 23 and 24, when we serve the Lord, we're to do whatever we do. We're to do it as we're serving the Lord and not men. We're to be zealous for good works. Titus 2, 14. What does that mean, to be zealous for good works? It means like there's a good work. I'm going to chase that down. I can't wait to do it. I don't wait for opportunities to come across me. I chase those opportunities down. If there's a good work. A Christian should be sprinting in that direction because that's just who we are. And so Paul is saying, hey, I want you guys to do these works and to do them in the right way. Think with me about the one talent man before I give you some practical things on how to find your gift and use them. Think about the one talent man in Matthew 25. What was his problem? You got the five talent man, the two talent man, and the one talent guy. What's wrong with the one talent guy? He was afraid. That's number one. Okay, what else? Daryl, you had something? What did the one talent guy do wrong? What did he get wrong? His faith was misplaced. His faith was misplaced. Okay. He had a low opinion of his master. He had a low opinion of his master. He didn't get a return. He made excuses for himself. Right? He said, I, I know you're a hard man. You reap where you don't sow, and you gather what you don't put in. And he just felt like he couldn't do it. And he was not successful in his work. He wasn't successful in his endeavors. And so if we take on that same spirit, the same thing would happen to us. What do you think would happen to the church if every member of the church took Paul's words here at heart, found what they could do, and did it with all their might? What do you think would happen to the church? He flourished. We're a physical body. We would grow, we would be healthy, we would be properly nourished. What do you think will happen to a congregation who doesn't take Paul's words to heart here? She'll die. Right? So the church is going to stand forever, but a local congregation, a local body, can eventually become so healthy, so imbalanced, that she just shrivels up and dies. And so Paul is saying, hey, I want you to put these things to practice. So here, I'm going to give you 13 practical ways to find your gift and also to use it with the Spirit of Christ. So here are 13 practical things that you and I can do. You say, I want to find my gift, but then don't just find it, but also use it in the way that I should, with this cheerfulness, this zeal, and all of that. And these aren't in order, so some of these will be on finding the gift, and some of these will be on maintaining the zeal that we should. We've got 10 minutes left, so um, I may not be able to give as much comment on these as I want. But the first one, number one. If you want to find your gift and then use it with the spirit of Christ, ask spiritually mature people that are close to you and know you best. You say, I want to know what I'm good at and what I can do. Find people that are spiritually mature and ask them. Paul could say to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6, I lay hands on you. I know what you can do. Fan into flame the gift of God that's been given to you. There are people that know you well. Trust them. Ask them, hey, what, what do you think I could do? I, I'm trying to figure this out. How could I contribute? Ask them. See, we sometimes, this is Romans 12, 3, we don't see ourselves as we should. We don't think we're any good at anything. But people that know us, they say, you'd be good at teaching this Bible class. And you, a person, you could go visit and You don't know this, but every time I see you, you brighten up my day. Find spiritually mature people and ask them. Number two, pray for God's direction. Psalm 143 in verse 8 says, I will look for your steadfast love in the morning. Show me, the, lead me in the way that I should go. Pray for God's direction. Pray for God to put you in the position to know what it is that you should be doing. Order my steps in your words, Psalm 119, 133. Pray directly to God for direction. How to find your gift and then use it in the right way. Number three, remember the time is short. Remember how short your time is, Psalm 89, 47. Some people really can't wait to work for the Lord, but just not right now. They, they're going to graduate first, or they're going to raise their kids first. They're going to retire, and then they're going to be active. But you see, for every season of life, and I'm not saying you're going to be the same amount of busy in the kingdom at every stage of life that you were before. Those things vary. And I'm not saying that you can't transition out of certain works in the church and say, look, I'm not serving in this capacity anymore, but I can still be a faithful Christian. Because you can. My point is, remember how short the time is. Don't continue to postpone faithfulness to God for a day that may never come. Number four. Five, I believe this is, right? Or number four. Number four, try new things and then give them 100%. Don't try something new and say, I'm not going to be any good at this, but I'm going to give it a try. Try new things and give it 100%. Paul said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, 
I box, not as one that beats the air. Paul says, I'm giving this by 100%. If you want to find out what you're good at in the kingdom, what you can contribute, try different things. But when you try them, do them with all of your might. Don't just give a minimal effort so you can check it off the box and say, well, I tried that. I told you that wouldn't work, right? I had a friend, his, he, he sold insurance, or he knew a guy that sold insurance. Whenever the guy didn't want to sell insurance, he'd knock on the door and say, hey, you don't want to buy any insurance today, do you? He wasn't going to be successful. He didn't want to sell any. Sometimes that's how we approach it. We say, well, I know I'm not going to be any good at this. Try new things and give it 100%. Next, here's one. I don't know why we don't do this, but here is one. Ask the elders about areas being neglected in the kingdom and how you can help. Remember, if you're the only one brave enough to do something, nobody can say, they, hey, you're not doing any good at that because you know what you can say to them? You do it, <laughs> right? Isaiah 6 and verse 8, hear my send me. Go to the elders and say, hey, um, are there any areas in the church that are being neglected? Any area where you could really use people to do more of or do something that's not being done? And then challenge yourself to do it. Next, how to do it, find your gift in the kingdom without losing the spirit of Christ. Take breaks to avoid burnout. Jesus was full of human. Somebody says, we need Bible authority for everything we do. Well, Jesus took naps, so there's your authority, right? <laughs> Listen, one of the key components behind the Sabbath in the Old Testament is to say to Israel, when you stop working, the world doesn't fall apart because there's a God that never sleeps. The whole world is not on your shoulders, right? God gave two reasons for the Sabbath. In Exodus 20, he said, I made the world in six days, and in seven, I rested, and you do the same thing. But in Deuteronomy 5, he says, I want you to keep the Sabbath because you were slaves in Egypt. That is to say, you will not go into Canaan and become slaves of your work. You're going to take a break. Mark 6, 30 through 31, the disciples were coming and going. They had no room so much as to eat. And Jesus said, come apart and rest a while. If you want to use your gift to the glory of God in the kingdom, you can do the gift all day long, but eventually we get irritable, we get cranky, we get frustrated. Take breaks, schedule break time to avoid burnout. Somebody says, I'd rather burn out than rust out, but God says you don't have to choose. Take breaks to avoid burnout. Number next, fan it into flame to avoid rust out. 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul said to Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God that's been given to you. That means stir it up. Do it to the best of your ability. Give it all that you've got. Um, here's one. What number are we on, by the way? Eight. Find out what you're naturally gifted at. Philippians 2, 20 through 22. Paul said this about Timothy. I have no man natural who will naturally care for your state like Timothy. What does that even mean? Paul had a lot of great co-workers, but he said Timothy was the one who could naturally care for them. It was as if Timothy was a natural nurturer, and he could send him into these hard situations, and Timothy could do it. Find out what you're naturally good at, but don't say nothing. And then do that. Number nine, remember the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. What you don't lose, you will use. What you don't use, you'll lose. I know guys who said, I used to be able to throw together a lesson like that. I just hadn't done one of those Devo things. And so I just, I remember when I used to, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. What did he do in the parable of the talents to the one talent man? He cursed him and all of that, but he wouldn't let his talent expire. He said what? Take it from the one and give it to who? The one who asked him. Work with others. Work with others. Partner with somebody else. Jesus sent people out two by two. That's on purpose because we do more with others than we could possibly do alone. Find somebody else. You say, I really want to do this. I don't know how this is going to go. Partner up with somebody else. Say, hey, would you mind doing this with me? Because we work better when we work together with others. Consider yourself as one who is just blessed to serve instead of one who is justified and complaining. Right? Consider your, I'm just blessed to be here. I'm just glad to be able to do this. You know, God doesn't really need me. He could be using anybody to preach. He could be using anybody to teach this class. I'm just blessed to be doing it. If we viewed ourselves that way, we'd serve with more enthusiasm. I think this is 14, or I mean 11 or 12, one of those. Which one is it, Chester? I think it's 12. There we go. Work well with others, see? You can't count. You need somebody who can't. Okay, 12. Train someone else to help you do what you're doing. Don't let your ability die. 2 Timothy 2, 2, Paul says, the things you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who'll be able to teach others also. It's always a shame in the church when we say, hey, we're about to baptize somebody. Who watches the baptismal? Oh, sister so-and-so used to do I don't know where she put the key. I don't know where they, I don't know who does that anymore. You know, who, who organizes it? I don't remember who. Hey, it's great you're serving. I'm glad about that. 
but train somebody else so that your work doesn't die in the grave with you. It's great that you're doing it. I'm glad you're serving. God's glad you're serving. But God wants the work to continue long after you and I physically expire. Invest in somebody else. Teach somebody else. Train yourself out of a job. Come alongside somebody else and say, hey, I think you'd be good at this. And here's the last one. Look to Jesus as an example. He says, the Son of Man came not to serve not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus spent his life on other people, and our lives are better when we do that as well. We've got three minutes. I think I can do these final seven things. Here are seven temptations to avoid in relation to failing to identify our gifts and using them with the attitude Paul mentions here. So I gave you 13 positive things we can do to find our gifts and talents. Here are seven temptations to avoid. And I just let all of these off of beware, and then we'll end the class for tonight. Beware of giving God the leftovers. Sometimes my job gets 100% of me, or at least 80. And my family, they get 10%. And then God gets what I'm so tired, however I would. I'm telling you, I really want to serve the Lord. I'm so tired. Beware of giving God the leftovers. Malachi 1, 5 through 8, God says, you wouldn't give that to your governor. You know that. Now, you wouldn't do that to a government official. Why would you do it to God? Beware of thinking someone else will do it or is already doing it. What if Matthew thought that in John 13? I will wash feet tonight, but I know. I know old Peter. He's always in the lead. He's going to do it. And Peter thought, well, John's the disciple he loves. Surely he'll do it. Beware of thinking. Because what ends up happening is nobody's doing what everybody knows needs to be done and what everybody thinks somebody else is already doing. Beware of thinking somebody else will do it. I know that area is already. They've got enough people doing that. Don't think that. Because guess what? She's thinking that. And he's thinking that. And then what we all know, oh, he's sick. He's going to get 100 cards. I'm not going to write him. And then he gets no cards. Oh, I know everybody's going to visit him. He's got, he's got a big family here. You see, it's often the people that are closest that may be the coldest. Don't assume. Somebody else will do it. You do it. Number three, beware of thinking the church doesn't need your gift. It does. The ear can't say, I had no need of you. The eye can't say that. Um, beware of letting people cause you to treat God poorly. This is a big one. Oh, I used to serve, but those people, they, what did God do to us, right? People quit the church sometimes because a person told them this, or a person shut down their gift or discouraged them. Don't let people cause you to treat God for them. Yep. I was going to ask you to repeat that one. How you worded it? Beware of letting people cause you to treat God for them. Thank you. And then I think we've got three, three more. Beware of overcommitting. I think it's interesting, if you do have to leave, that's fine, I'm going to do these last three. I think it's interesting that Paul in the New Testament epistles includes his travel plans. Why? Because Paul knew he couldn't be everywhere. He even says in 1 Corinthians 16 and in verse number 12, Apollos is not coming to Corinth right now. When he has a convenient season, he'll come. You can't do everything. Beware of overcommitting. Tell people, not this year, but I can come next year. I can't do that right now, but in the next quarter, my, I'm busy right now. And if I did it right now, I wouldn't do the very best. But if you sign me up next quarter, hey, here's the area of time when I could really give you 100%. Beware of overcommitment. Because if you stretch yourself too thin, right, you'll be no good at all. Beware of thinking your gift or the exercise of your gift can make up for a shallow soul or a lack of deep spirituality. Don't think, well, you know what? I'm not going to read the Bible and pray, but I'm real busy at the church. Your exercise of your gift and my exercise of mine will not make up for a shriveled up soul. You really have to dig in and be spiritually minded yourself. And here's the last one, and probably the most important one tonight. We talked a lot about gifts, but I want you to hear me well on this, because this is probably the most important point, I think at least. Beware of identifying with your gift. You are not your gift. We don't get our value or our self-esteem from our gifts. We get our value and our esteem from God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, our sufficiency is not from ourselves, it's from God. You're not what you can do. You know why that's true? Because if I get in a car accident tonight and I never preach another sermon, my name's still written in heaven. I'm not preaching. I'm not teaching. That's not who I am. It's what I do. But beware of getting your identity from your gift. Because if you lose it, or if you're, able, unable, if you're ever unable to do it, it'll ruin you. You'll be crushed. We are who we are because God loves us. We're not our position. We're not our office. We're not our talents. We're so much more than those things. We're loved by God. We're redeemed. And we're heaven bound. And when you know that, you can serve without arrogance and without timidity. Because God loves me before I can do anything for him. 
Romans 12, 4 through 8 says, all of us can contribute something. So I hope tonight, I know the last part wasn't much questions. I tried to put that at the beginning, but I hope this caused you to think. I want you to think about what you can do because you can do something. And if you don't do anything else tonight, ask somebody else, what can I do to help the kingdom? Because God's capital. Thanks for a good Bible class tonight. Appreciate it.